Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jen Lint of JKK Custom Knives. I met Jen and saw her work during the last hour of Blade Show this year, which was unfortunate because her knives were right up my alley, but my blade budget was blown. What caught my eye were her unabashedly aggressive knife designs. Rendered in an intricate, organic, almost primeval manner. Sounds poetic, but you'll see what I mean. Uh, By the time I got to her booth, she only had a few tactical EDC fixed blades left, a big pickal, and a fits my hand perfectly karambit. But I've noticed on her Instagram feed that she's been working on something new and exciting, and I didn't get to see that in person. We'll talk all about that and much more. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And if you want to help support the show, go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. Jen, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Ah, It's our pleasure. Um, So this was the first time I saw your work and met you uh, this year at Blade Show. Was this your, your first show? So it was definitely my first show exhibiting. I've been going like just as a customer to Blade Show since 2015 when my my knife obsession started. But it was it was really cool to get the full experience and get to meet as many people as as I did this year. And it's really cool to see uh, Blade Show kind of returning to what it was after COVID hit, because I remember it was pretty slow after the the first couple of years of that. So you were uh you were right next to john gray and uh, aaron bieber uh john gray i I, i've met just through uh bieber uh but i love both of their knives you you were in a great spot absolutely and those are two of some of the best guys you'll ever meet i mean john gray i i don't know how he doesn't get tired of my phone calls but he's been (laughs) a, a really helpful mentor to me and answered all my questions all my phone calls so i i'm really appreciative of everything he's done to help me this year so that's uh that's interesting i um his work is very excuse me his work is very aggressive too uh but at the same time you know uh graceful and uh yeah, I really like his um, some of his Pakal stuff, but definitely his pocket knives. And I, I can see how there is some how he would be a good mentor for your style uh, of knife. How, how would you describe your style of knife? I would describe my style as tactical art knives. I want them to be tough enough to take a beating, but also uh, easy on the eyes in a way. Let's see one. Uh, so we know what we're so- talking about. I'll go ahead and show you one of the the knives that kind of first started it for me. And that is my Predator model. And that's just a good size seven and a half inch fixed blade, which is fit perfectly to my hand in a smaller hand. But if you have a little bit of a bigger hand, uh, I have a few more models that I came out with to to accommodate that. So wait, wait, hold hold that back up. I think that's the one that I described in the intro as a fits my hand perfectly yep. karambit. Um, uh, oftentimes I'll find, oh, that's, that's beautiful. I like your, um, I like your maker's mark too. Thank Is it you. like an ace, uh, ace of spades or something? Yeah, it's it's part of my logo. I have uh, spade tattoos all over me, so it's just kind of it's kind of stuck. Cool. Well, I I often find that with my medium sized hands, karambits have an extra fingers worth. You know, for people with giant mitts, uh, mm-hmm. and and that doesn't work for me. I mean, uh, for me, for a karambit, that's where. Uh, it's going to get caught in the clothing or on the arm or on something, and you want it just all blade coming out. So that's something I definitely appreciated about about your what did you call that model? Predator. That's called that's called my Predator, and that is it's like you said. Most of the karambits are are larger, and I mean most most fixed blades have big handles just to ac- accommodate everybody's size hand. But for me, with women's clothing and trying to conceal, it was just way too hard to have that big of a knife on me. So that knife is, is, I mean, I've designed it perfectly to fit my hand and a female's hand. So, uh, that's, that's great. Cause it, it fits my hand great too. And, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't want that extra, 
you know, because I get in these karambit fights all the time. And if you're not, um, <laughs> you know, if you're not concerned about getting it leveraged out of your hand, uh, you're in big trouble. I want to get to how your knife obsession started in 2015. But before we leave, uh, Blade Show, I just wanted to ask you, what was the reception? How did people uh, like your work? I mean, overall, it was really good for me. I just got a lot of exposure. I got to meet a lot of new faces. And I mean, someone who was really cool that I got to meet was Tomas with Tactical mm -hmm. Tavern on Instagram. And he actually came over and, and put my knives to use and showed them off a little bit. But overall, I have zero complaints. Um, I got a lot of good orders. One thing I do that I, I guess most custom knife makers don't do is I like to take uh, custom designs from my customers and bring those to life as well, mm. just because it helps me push my, uh, my making skills as, as a knife maker. So kind of uh, forcing you to into doing things that uh, you wouldn't have forced yourself to do if you weren't asked basically. Exactly. Uh, so 2015, you said your blade obsession started. How did it start? So as a kid, I've always been into the survival shows. I mean, I always had a pocket knife on me and it wasn't really um, like a big set event that did it. But I was scrolling on Instagram one day and I think I saw some Ron Best knives just pop up like super dressed out, fancy, fancy blades. And I just started scrolling and scrolling and that never really ended. And uh, I got introduced by a friend to a company called Microtech. And me at the time I was interning at Georgia Tech for a kind of like a student internship. And I got to pick what my project was going to be and gave a presentation on that. And I just kind of went ahead and called up to Microtech and was like, hey, you know, I'm I'm 15, 16 years old. I've never made a knife and I absolutely love your company. I would love to come up if you guys would have me to to learn. And I got a call about a week later and he had me up a, a, a couple times. And ever since I, I've been up there to experience what he's been able to build, it, it just kind of lighted a spark for me. So. That's amazing. Wow. What a, what a mentor to, I mean, what a, what a person to draw you in and to, and to show you the, the secrets. I, I, um, I, I assume you're talking about uh, Anthony Marfione, Marfioni. Yes, sir. I got I got to uh, work with him, and then briefly Sebastian Berengi with Borka Blades was up there as yeah. well. So uh, I'm, I'm currently obsessed with the stitch. You know, I, I love that. It's one too. of my favorite favorite knives right now. And uh, Microtech uh, recently, I've, I've had Microtechs for a while, but they recently resuscitated my love of folders because I've I've gone way off the deep end into into custom fixed blades, mm -hmm. uh, but the stitch and the amphibian this year. Uh, oh, brought yeah. me brought me back to <laughs> to folders and uh, that's that's a, a great um well that's a great place to go and great people to learn from uh, let me ask you this how how were your parents how did your parents react to that as a project well at the time it was just me and my mom and my mom is a very very successful uh, businesswoman and what she does she does a lot of forensic work for the state and I mean at the time the world so I mean, she was the one that helped me get the internship that I was doing, and she's always been one to push me and, and help me help provide me with the tools that I need to get to where I want to be. So she drove up there with me. She was working on her laptop while I was in the shop. And I mean, she's even helped me help like finance equipment if if I didn't have what I needed to get where I was at this year. So she's been more than supportive for me and, and I wouldn't be able to do do this without it. So. Ah, I love that. I love hearing that. Uh, I would be very supportive of my daughters in any of their knife endeavors. They know that. I've made that clear. I'm not sure they have those, but they do. They also love knives. Uh, so you you started uh, Microtex. They really reeled you in. And now when we look at, at um, here, hold up an, another knife and let's let's draw a path from your first uh, Ron Best or Microtex. Oh, look at this. There we go or your first Microtech obsession to this. All right, now, if you're only listening, uh, we're looking at about a five-inch double-edged karambit with a sukumaki wrap and uh, a, 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 what's that thing that's under the wrap called? I always forget that. It's yeah. called a manuki. Manuki, that's right. So, <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry, Jen, bring that back up. Let's take a look. So what is this made of? And tell us generally how you go about, how you go about making these. 
Huh. So this is made from 8670 steel. Uh, I knew if I was coming out with a blade that was this large, I needed to come out with somewhat of a more of affordable option. Mm -hmm. uh, so I used a carbon steel and a big ins another bit like big inspiration for me with my fixed blades and my karambits is definitely Bastinelli and just seeing, mm -hmm. I mean, I think every year I've gone to, to blade show, I've come back with at least one Bastinelli. And I mean, I make all of these in house. Uh, I do have the bigger ones and like most of the Karam bits laser cut out just because if you've ever made a knife with a hole at the end, mm -hmm. you know, the pain of trying to drill and dremel these out perfectly. So it saves me a lot of time, um, time doing it that way. Uh, I love 8670. I only have, I, I have two kitchen knives made of it and they're super thin, super flexible, really sharp. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, tend to rust if you don't take care of them, but that's yep. carbon steel. Uh, it's, it's a newish steel. Um, I think, is it only pops that sells that? Isn't that a proprietary? I believe so. And I think there is a higher level of nickel in it, which, uh, I mean, compared to 1084, you're not going to have as bad of, of a rust issue, but still, if you don't know how to take care of a carbon steel, it's, it's going to patina over time. So. Okay. Uh, if you would hold that, hold that big double-edged karambit back up, what's it called? And this is called my beast model. Beast. Okay, so this is yeah. You said you're you're um, inspired by uh, in a way Bastinelli mm -hmm. and uh, Bastin Cove, and he's a you know he's a collie guy and uh, really knows how to use his knives. Um, do you train in this, or are you um, when you make a knife like this? Are you testing it out? Are you feeling how it feels in your hand and uh, that kind of thing? Cutting stuff. Absolutely. I mean, I always take take at least one of my blades of the model and I put it to work. Um, I mean, it's not something that I go and take classes for to get training on, but I've had a lot of people ask me about it. And I've done some research and there are a few places around here that do some um, like if I'm going to learn with a karimba, I want it to be like the actual Filipino fighting style. So I, I would say in, in a few months, I'm going to branch out and do that. It's just right now with my husband deployed and everything, I, I've got a lot on my plate. So I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to manage. The, the reason I ask is uh, that big karambit, um, mm -hmm. you don't see, you know, usually you see smaller karambits like this and, and uh, the blade angle, sometimes it points kind of straight forward and sometimes uh, more down, uh, almost like a straight knife. And when it's short like that, it kind of doesn't matter in, in mm -hmm. a way. I'm sure some karambit guys are going to start arguing. But uh, with that long one, it seems like you have the point right in the perfect spot to uh, do kind of a, a loose back fist jab and have that point going where it needs to go. So it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it looks like, you know, it like that you've fought with uh, or learned how to fight with that kind of knife and and designed it that way. Um, because the point, it just seems like it's in the perfect place uh, to not just to slash, but also to stab, basically. Yeah, and I mean, the way this beast actually came about was what we started talking about with the Predator is it's the perfect size for some people's hand, but for other people, it's it's very small. And so I kind of was just sitting and looking at it one day and I was like, you know what, I'm going to scale this up to be 12 inches overall. <laughs> and if your hand does not fit that, then, then I can't help you because my full hand fits, I mean, on the regular handle. And when, when I hold it back here, you have about an inch and a half left. So it's a very yeah. roomy knife. All right. So let's go back to, to the Microtech days. I want to I want to figure out how you got to be able to make knives like that in a relatively short period of time. Uh, mm -hmm. So you go to Microtech. What did you learn there? What, like, what was your project there? So I had come with uh, billets of steel, like I, I brought a dam of steel, a few Alabama Damascus, just stuff that I picked up at Blade Show that year. And we had previously, um, I mean, my, my mentor at the time who I was working with at Georgia Tech taught me how to use CAD software. So we had designed that and had them water jet out. And so I brought them up already cut out. One of them was a super long Tonto that was very, very thin. And Anthony just kind of looked at me and was like, look, you know, you wouldn't know this because you're new, but this is something that's probably going to have a lot of issues warping. So, I mean, he literally took this huge piece of Vegas forged steel and just put it in my hands and was like, we're going to learn how to do this from start to finish. So, I mean, it took it took a few days just because, I mean, making a knife is not a, I mean, you can make a knife in a day, but if you want to make a really good knife, it's going to take some time. And we used a milling machine, uh, drill presses. I got to see how to heat treat 
grinding. They have, honest to God, one of the nicest grinding rooms I have ever seen with ventilation. I'm very jealous. But, um, I mean, he pretty much walked me through everything all the way down to sharpening. And for me, I wasn't obviously an expert when I left that day, but it gave me a lot of skills and things to practice with to get good at. Now that, I mean, for me, I have to see to, to learn and to do. I can't, I mean, I can watch a video, but I really have to, to have a hands-on experience. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, there's a reason why um, like age old uh, crafts and skills like knife making uh, happen in an apprenticeship sort of uh, environment, like anything mm -hmm. important, you know, plumbing, electricity, uh, you you have to have people showing you. A lot of people do learn uh, are self-taught and I, I admire that, but I like, you kind of need uh, to see someone else do it to believe it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a in a sense uh so you get back from microtech is that when you start making work and make uh, is that when you start jkk custom knives in earnest or was it a what was that process so i guess i would say from 2015 to to 2018 2019 i i was still in high school i went to college and got my business degree it was more of just a hobby for me then and i did sell a few pieces here and there but it wasn't honestly until last year, right before Blade Show, when I just graduated and I was like, you know, I do not like working for other people. It's not that I, I can't work as a team with, with people, but it's just when I'm not allowed to be my creative self and, and go to work and, and really enjoy what I'm doing, I'm just not happy. So I sat down and was like, you know, what do I really enjoy doing and what could I make make it into a business? And that's when I started JKK Customs and um, John Gray actually last Blade show, I wasn't exhibiting with him, but he let me put a few of my pieces in his case. And from there, it just kind of took off and I, I orders were coming in left and right. So. Wow. So uh, you first showed at Blade show in John Gray's cabinet. You had a couple of things there and people bought them and, and that's what started it. Wow. Indeed. So JKK, what does that stand for? uh gen cake customs with the k knives oh okay oh okay i got you customs with a k and um, that that logo was actually created back in 2015 by my older sister and i mean people have told me it first was the jkk with a circle around it so if you have one of my knives with the circle you really do have a special piece because i'm not going to be doing any more with that logo but it's just cool to me that that i was able to to keep that logo and have it be personal to me so so as a knife maker and as a, a company, do you have a catalog of designs that people can choose from? Uh, you mentioned before that you like taking on the challenge of someone's custom design, uh, but but you yourself, um, do you have a catalog that you go back to or are you constantly making new stuff and how does that work? I mean, in, I would say the next few months, I have been talking with someone about getting a website put together that would have just like a, a page that you can scroll through and see all the different designs that I've done. And even if it's an old design, I tell people, if you do not mind a wait and want to get on my list, uh, I would be, be happy to make you whatever you want within reason. Uh, I really haven't turned a knife design down yet. But I would say one of the most challenging ones that I've had to do, I actually do have with me was this uh, really aggressive recurve style. Ooh, that's cool. And I mean, I, what I do when I'm taking on a design like that is I always get a piece of 8670 and draw it out and do a whole prototype. And, you know, most people want a stainless steel. So it leaves me with, um, I mean, normally this one's not going to be as good as the, the second one that I do just because I've had practice on it. But it leaves me with one to show off to people and, and base it off of. But... Yeah, I would say look out for a website sometime soon. And I, I really want to put an option on there to uh, have people where they can submit their custom designs, pick a steel, handle material, all that. And then it just comes straight back to me. So that way I'm able to turn things out a little bit quicker. So uh, right now it, it's singularly me doing my accounting, my designing, my outsourcing. I mean, I do pretty much every aspect of this, which which is really cool, but it's it's getting to be a lot of work. So, right, right, uh, but it's a great place for you to be as JKK grows. Uh, you'll know every aspect of the business, and you'll know how to lord over your employees when you have. I shouldn't say lord over, but you know, uh, you'll you'll know what what to look for. Um, take us through the the design 
process. Uh, you know, you have an idea for a knife. Um, and, and I understand that the knife you were just holding up is someone else's custom design that you executed. Uh, but for you personally, when you're, when you're coming up with a design, it, how does that work? Are you inspired by something and then you just start going or do you set out, uh, I need to make a karambit people like my karambits and you go from there. Honestly, I mean, what I tell people is the best, best designs that I personally come up with, uh, in my opinion, are the ones where I'm just sitting there. I, I'm a little bit ADHD, so my mind's constantly turning and I just have something pop into my head and I'm like, ooh, I need, I need to draw that and write that down right now so I don't forget it. And I will draw it up, uh, cut it out and see how it feels in the hand and then immediately go in. I mean, if it's something... That's like just a Tonto like this. I can just shape that with a, a blue, tri not a Trizac, but a really blue, aggressive blue belt, like a 26 grit and profile that out. And those are a little bit easier for me to do. But the ones like the Karambits that you saw, I take my CAD design and I have a guy up in Demaris, Georgia named Josh Peaks. And he works out of Piedmont Metal Processing. And he actually... He's one of the rare people that's like, I do not want your money. I think what you do is really cool. But if you want to throw me a knife here and there, uh, oh, yes. we can definitely do business. So every time I go up with a project, I always bring him a knife. And he, he's he's a really big help to me. So Will work for knives. Yeah, yep. I like that. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so when you're coming up with these knives, I know that some of it is, is your artful approach and uh, your... Um, being inspired by artful knife makers like Bastinelli and 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 those types, but and John Gray, but how much of this is based on personal self defense when you make something like this? You have that that uh, I want I want to see that Pical, um, but also those Karambits. I mean, they are nasty nasty weapons as well as beautifully uh, created uh, crafts or not crafts but tools. What? How much of that is you thinking about, I could use this to protect myself? Well, I mean, it, it absolutely is me thinking about that because the area I'm at, I mean, one, I grew up in Atlanta and two, now I'm in a little bit north of that in Gainesville. Being like with my husband deployed, for example, I have to go out a lot and do things on my own. And I've had some instances and run-ins with people where if I did not have my my fixed blade or my pistol on me, which which I have Bastion's F bag on my own, oh, sweet. my chest at all times. It's just when people see that you have something, they're way less likely to try anything on you. And I mean, I design all of my my smaller knives, at least for me to carry that are completely concealed. I can move around comfortably with them and they are easily ready to pull out. And I mean, I the way I position a lot of my sheaths and I'll go ahead and show that Picao that I have is it's going to be positioned to where when you pull it out, you're already ready with either the double edge on this side or the the edge on this side with I mean, I threw some partial serrations on this one, but mm. I mean, yeah, if you if you get into a I mean, I, I hope you wouldn't have to get into a hand in hand combat situation. I, I would definitely recommend one of these just because of the options that it gives you. So, yeah. And that uh, natural uh, pulling motion, you know, just with the, the arcing of your uh, your shoulder and your elbow and that uh, having the edge on the inside and pulling and tearing uh, very mm -hmm. natural animalistic clawing kind of. Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, absolutely. So you've mentioned your husband is deployed. Um, do you send him knives? I mean, I'm not sure what his role is, but uh, I know that whatever your role is, having a good knife on you is always uh, a welcome thing. So where they're at right now, he's in Eastern Europe in Kosovo. I mean, I really don't know how much I can go into it, so I'll just I'll just stick with that. But from what I understand is he doesn't want to have to worry about getting anything back through customs or, mm. or people taking things. I'm sure that he could, but mostly what they have over there is just what the army gives them. Mm -hmm. But he definitely has a pile of knives waiting for him when he gets <laughs> back. Um, I mean, the ones that I wouldn't necessarily like the blems, mm -hmm. uh, he, he gets all the blems and I, I normally carry those as well. So, but yeah, he, he's been more than supportive. I, I also wouldn't be able to do this without him. So is he also a knife person? 
he's not as crazy as I am, but from being with me for, for close to four to five years now, he loves going to these shows. I mean, he's a huge Bast, uh, Bastinelli fan. He has some bench maids. So he, he's getting his own taste. That's for sure. Uh, my, my wife and I met years ago now, uh, over 20 years ago, doing uh, Filipino Kali. So uh, knives go way back. Um, but you know, like you guys, I'm the nut and she's, she's like, Oh yeah, that's cool. You know, from, yeah. the, and she has a nice little collection herself and knows how to use them. But, um, I think that every household needs at least one knife nut, uh, you know, to, oh yeah, to be a functioning household. Um, so I'm interested about, uh, your, your, uh, meant how, like how you actually got the physical chops to do that kind of grinding. And I know you mentioned uh, John Gray. We're coming back to him and how he was a mentor. But um, did he or anyone else but after Microtech show you the actual ins and outs of how the hell do you grind a double-edged karambit and all that kind of stuff? I'll be honest, um, no. I mean, I obviously use YouTube when I need it, but I have just ground a lot of blades, uh, a lot of practice. And it's just the more you do, the better you get at and the more you figure out. And it's like I said, I, I really learned by having that hands on experience. And people tell me that, like, why did you start with the most difficult blade shape? But to <laughs> me, I mean, grinding a karambit at first was easy. And then I started to grind something, let's say, like a, a straight Ooh. bevel and you get that straight line that's that's even harder to me than than trying to grind a karambit but i think that's just because i haven't done as as many of them but i am getting better at it so all right all right hold that back up that's it looks like a sax and a karambit put together uh this is this is very different in that it's not a curved blade and mm -hmm. yeah that's a perfectly straight um that's a really cool knife Th tell us about this design so this is my cleavage model. Uh, I <laughs> named it that just right. because I thought it was a sexy cleaver. And for me, I really just like having the security of the rings on, on the back of my fixed blades, just so nothing will slip out of my hand. And I mean, uh, I'll hold this up too. When you have my knives, this isn't all like this, this hook back here isn't just for show. I mean, you could use it as a glass breaker. You could hit someone on the head with it. And I mean, it goes the same thing for this. It can be kind of a, a backup in a way. But this one was more of, I wanted to do like a, a utility style that was also uh, good for, for combat as well. And mm -hmm. it does have a bigger handle. It was one of the ones I came out with after the Predator model just to accommodate that. Uh, I like when I have the option with a ringed uh, knife to, to in forward grip, not use the ring. I don't, I, I like rings on my forefinger. I don't like them on my mm -hmm. pinky. Uh, so I like using that ring as the pommel and it looks like there's enough room uh, there at least for my hands to, oh, yeah. to do to do that or to put the or to do the pinky thing if that's your um if that's what you like i i so hold that up again i like this rock pattern that you do on the blade um yep, the rock the, grind yeah what where does that come from what's the inspiration that that is definitely inspired by borka and the borka stitch that was, I mean, it, it was a really cool experience for me last year because when I went to my first show, one of the first knives I got to, to handle was Sebastian's first stitch folder. Mm. And I knew from the day that I saw that, that that's the knife that I was going to save up for. So it took me, I would say four to five years, but after some saving, I, I got to get my first custom sit, uh, stitch from Borka and John Gray. And Whoa. that one is never leaving my collection. So is that, uh, um, uh, you said by both of them, John Gray is a part of that. Uh, is, so is he I, part of that knife? So I believe they do a collaboration together where um, it goes, I guess, fully. The parts are, are ready and, and made and John would grind the blade, put the, the texturing and, and anodizing he does on the handle and whatever finish he chooses to do. So it's yeah. it's. Uh, I guess half and half collaboration. I know mm. that Sebastian, it's like working with um, Mike Bond or Anthony. They they all just kind of work together on those knives. So I love that. I, a meeting of, of the best knife minds, you know? Um, so what's the clever girl? Oh yeah. So the clever girl, and I, I actually do have the 3d printed prototype, but 
I could never, and I still can't carry my stitch in my pocket because of how small female pockets are. Um, I could never carry a folder and I wanted to kind of take a design. And this, this came about from a very small fixed blade that one of my older mentors came up with. And I was, I just kept looking at that knife and I was like, if this had some modifications to it, this would be the most, I mean, amazing folder for me. Like I, there's nothing else that I would want from a folder like just from that subtle curve that you get at, on the blade shape it's not too much of a a curve but it is it's just the perfect folder for me and it's definitely inspired by the clever girl scene from jurassic park with yeah. that little bit of a raptor claw look at and this night okay, so so uh you described this as what a prototype or what you would you just call this so this i i call it my prototype because when I first made it, I, I immediately knew, like, there's some things I need to change about this. And I'll, I'll go into that with being the size of it. If you have bigger hands, let's say you're trying to thumb flick it out. Ooh, wrong way. Um, you're pushing, if you look, that lock bar into mm -hmm. the detent. So you're going to have a little bit of trouble deploying it. If you're doing it with your left hand, no issues at all because you're not pushing in. But um, that is actually how I'll show the size difference here. Oh, cool this bigger clever girl XL is going to come out and I, I am super excited to bring this one to life. It has a bigger hole for flicking out and deployment. And it's also going to be a, a front flipper as well. So that is such a cool knife. I got to say that is a really cool folder design. Uh, ho hold up the, the original one again. How, I mean, so I'm looking at this, this looks like a, a top dollar, you know, man, how did you go from uh, not not that your karambits don't look incredible also, but how mm -hmm. did you go from that, which is relatively simple to being mm -hmm. able to make that, which looks relatively complex with the inlay and the and the contour titanium and, and all that? Mm -hmm. How that it's happen? it's a lot of planning um, CAD design. There's a guy up in Mosheim, Tennessee called Keith Edict, and he's been a really big help for the next run of these clever girls, just because I don't have a milling machine or, or the big CNCs in my shop to, to bring these things to life just yet. It is next on my list. Um, Cause I just got a Paragon and a TW 90 grinder. Oh, nice. So I'm going to be going up to, to his shop to, I mean, basically use the equipment and, and bring these things to life for me right now, if I were to make a, a folder fully in my shop and, and try to cut these lock bars and stuff, it just would not be, the quality that I want to deliver to people. So it's, it's just really getting help from, from people that are helping me learn and, and grow every day. So, so you're, what, what you're doing is what everyone wants to do. You're having your amazingly, you know, you're, you're having your self-designed folder made in the United States uh, in Absolutely. this case by yourself. And then also with the help of, uh, of, of Mr. Edict, he said his name was. Yep. Um, Keith. That's what people want to be doing. Uh, I know as as the numbers grow, it becomes more and more, uh, Keith. Yeah, I know that as numbers grow, uh, it becomes more and more difficult to do something like that. But you're but you're doing it right now with this clever girl model, which is so cool. So what's the philosophy behind this knife? It's obviously it's an EDC sized um, luxury, we'll call it uh, folder, but it's also looks like quite a tactical something or other. So tell me about the design of this. I mean, I just wanted something that fit really nicely with that went with the natural curve of your hand. And I really like a knife that I can bear down on if if I'm trying to, I guess, really work with it. So you have a nice place to to stick your thumb up here. And it's also if your hand's a little bit bigger, this curve on the end allows you to wrap your thumb around and get a really good grip on this. Let's say if you wanted to hold it in reverse for a, a, a combat situation. So you have kind of a, I guess a way to use it as and like a karambit while also um just having an, an all-around good fixed plate or not fixed plate but just edc holder so yeah uh it's really cool i i really like the shape of that blade uh you you showed up uh showed the larger 3d print of it now is this uh is this just the size will you be making them the same way in that larger size or or is this the way it's represented here with a more plain look is this something you're going to be doing on a more mass scale for the larger version 
So for this next go around, um, I mean, I'm doing things a little bit differently. What I, I'm telling people probably this upcoming week, I'm going to do a video on it, is I'm going to open my my pre-order list and I'm going to have three options for, for this knife. And you're going to like to reserve your spot. You're going to have to put a deposit down and just kind of have the understanding that I am one person and I'm having hands on on all of these knives. And I mean, good things take time. So from August to September, that's going to be a month for people to get in, reserve their spots, and come September, that that's also when my husband's going to get back. So I want to have some some time to be with him as well. Yeah. I'm going to start basically ordering the materials that I need, get everything together, and just start doing them one by one. And the options I'm going to have on those are a little bit different than what I had this time. Is you're going to have two. Uh, I guess the, the lower option with price is going to be camo carbon or fat carbon scales on one side as a show side and then titanium on the other with, um, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to go with magna cut blades for all these again, because I, I really liked how those performed. The second one would be a full titanium, which I mean, I like to give personalized options and kind of tailor make the knife to the customer I'm, I'm working for. So they could have something crazy like the, the blue, and mm. I've also been doing some uh, kind of crazy two-tone backspacers as well. That that would be an option. And the last one will be these fancy uh, mammoth molar inlays. <sighs> and I'm going to have blue and green. I'm really excited for the green to have like a bright green-gold uh, combination for anodizing. So those will be the three options. Uh, I know I'm going to have two or three custom auction pieces I'm doing with some Nickel, Slither, Sand, Mai, Stainless, Ooh. and Moku Tai from him. So those are going to be really, really cool. I'm, I'm excited to see how those turn out. That is cool. So you're uh, so uh, the the ordinary run that no, I shouldn't call it ordinary, but the run that people can get in on uh, in the month of August has three different options. Uh, and you said Magna Cut. You were just holding up one with Damascus. Those are only for the special uh, special order options. Yeah, I mean, for Damascus, like, I like working with it, but part of my brand is, again, the tactical. I want you to use it. I want there to be a really, I'm not saying Damascus isn't strong, but if you've mm -hmm. ever done a a folder in Carbon Damascus, the, the internal area where your pivot's going to be, if you don't mask it and keep it oiled, there's a chance of rust, and you're not going to have that action like you would if it was a, like, Magna Cut or M390. So. Okay. The, the auction pieces will definitely be the Damascus, but I mean, I just prefer the, the plain steel and I can do acid stone wash, uh, stone wash. I don't know if you guys have seen, I actually do have a knife with it on there. My, uh, my splatter finish, which <laughs> people cool. are calling uh, Van Halen, like Eddie Van Halen's guitar. Yeah. yeah. I've done one of those. And then I, there's a guy named Steve Miller who I'm doing a collaboration with right now who just mirror polished one of my Magna Cut blades, which I did not even think would, would be possible. But oh, that wow. is, I cannot wait to show people that one in, in a week or two. So what uh, can you reveal which model it is? It's going to be the uh, one of the smaller Clever Girls. It's it's the last prototype. And it's oh, going to okay. be set up this this exact same way with the blue, gold, and uh Damage steel pivot with that mirror polish blade, and it's going to be one hell of a piece. That's uh, you know, it's really cool how you're doing these in very small batches and American made. It it feels like what uh, like when Les George first started making the VSEP, and it was the I don't know people started talking about mid tech knives. This was probably when you were in high school at this point. But uh, do you remember mid tech? You you heard a lot about that, and it was makers like Absolutely. yourself who needed to expand their capacity and have some of the stuff done out of house. Uh, but it all goes through your hands and gets sharpened by you. And um, I, I like that to me, that's uh, after a, after this long period of time going to China and having them expertly make, you know, giant batches, this is kind of coming back to the roots of, of uh, a custom knife maker expanding their business, like the old school way of doing it. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I, I want to take as many orders as I can. But what I tell people is, you know, I really want to go through each one of these knives and make sure that it performs exactly how I want it to. 
again, my, my husband was not planning on getting a folder, but he did this year from one that I just, I worked with. And when, when you held it, there was a little bit of, of rattle when you shook it. And I was like, you know, this, this is not something that I want out in, in people's hands. So for me, I, that's what I take pride on is, is my customer service and, and my product is if anything ever goes wrong, you send it back to me and I'm going to make it right regardless, just because, you know, as, as I've been a customer before, that's how I would want to be treated. So that's the service that I want to offer to people. When I was uh, poking around on your website, um, there was a great picture of you outside with your with an old grinder. I think this is uh, a, a while ago, but you're outside and you're grinding a knife. But it, I, I love that picture because uh, it showed your passion for making knives despite... Um, despite any obstacles, like sometimes, and I am totally prone to this. Um, and I've, I've learned to, I've learned to get over it, but that sort of thing that, Oh, I can't start this. I don't have every awesome machine I need to be John Gray. So I'm just, I'm going to wait until I can get that perfect grinder. That picture of you outside, you know, making one of your knives on an old grinder. Um, I don't know. It, 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 uh, resonated with me because it's like by hook or by crook, I'm making this knife. Yeah. And that, I mean, I'm fortunate this year. I mean, when I got my TW90, it was a game changer. It was like going from a Honda Civic to a Ferrari. It, <laughs> it completely changed my game. And what I told people before is, look, you know, it's going to take me a little bit longer to do this because I can't tilt my grinder. I can't slow my grinder down. Like trying to work titanium on a non-variable speed. Good luck. It's just going to yeah. melt. Um <laughs> Yeah. And I didn't have the small grinding wheel attachments, so I was doing a lot of Dremel work, a lot of hand sanding. And I mean, from where I came from to, to what I'm doing now, it's I mean, I have the tools to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's how I did the rock grind before was up on that that metal wheel to where I mean, it would be shaking in my hands. I didn't have the rubber on there. It was it was an experience, but learning and coming from from where I did to where I'm at now I I don't think I would have the skills I would if I didn't have to figure those things out so right right like on the and that video was was not the one I was talking about like this one you were outside outside it was a different grinder and everything but but yeah the point is learning how to um you know if if you can grind that knife on that craftsman or whatever it was then when you get to that grinder you just said something something 90 it's gonna it's be the, like the tw90 by travis words oh oh travis words okay we yep. all know travis words absolutely um, so uh yeah that that's got to be such a good feeling getting the right tool uh especially after um well it's like you said you've been driving around the honda civic it's a great car it'll go forever mm -hmm. uh, but ferrari's better oh yeah <laughs> um uh so what are the knives like? Do you have anything in the offing? I know you're working on the Clever Girl, and that's like, um, that's probably a very long term project to, to, to actually. Before I ask this next question, I want to, I want to finish up with the Clever Girl. What were the, some of the, some of the real challenges in design um, that you faced going from making Karambits and Picals to that knife? I mean, really, if you have the knowledge and the correct software with CAD, you can take a fixed blade and turn that in that software into a folder and it does the work for you. You can even make the knife move in CAD. So if you're doing things and drawing and just changing things little by little, it's going to take you a lot longer. And I mean, that's one of the things Keith helped me with is he was like, look, you know, if you have your design in mind, I can help you figure out the way that we need to design this to where it's going to be perfect. I mean, the only thing that I would say I've experienced some trouble with is trying to get detent right and lined up. And I mean, having the right size detent ball to where it falls in that hole perfectly and you don't have that rattling. Mm -hmm. um, but past that, I mean, having just having the right software is going to make your life a lot easier. So... So basically he's saying, yeah, come, come up with what you want the opened knife to look like. And we'll figure out all of the mechanical geometry to make the lock up right. And to make it, uh, fit within the design. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's, cool. that's amazing. I mean, uh, I mean, that's a great benefit of, uh, of this kind of design instead of having, uh, to go trial and error, trial and error, you can at least get closer. I mean, I'm sure there, once you bring everything into the physical world, you're dealing with actual materials, 
I'm sure there's tweaking that happens after, but it, gets, but it gets you so much closer and that saves a lot of time. And, and uh, yeah. So Absolutely. what I was going to ask you was what is, uh, is the knife, the next knife you're looking to design something that you've always wanted to make that you haven't yet. Oh man. I mean, I'll be honest right now, my books are, I mean, this is not even including the, the clever girl orders just cause I mean, I've been trying to figure out the best way to do that. You're looking at a year and a half out. So I'm not saying I, I don't have time to be creative and come up with new stuff right now, but it's just, I I'm trying to fill orders. I have been experimenting with some chef's knives lately just because, um, I do a lot of cooking and I do have a lot of chef friends. I used to work in a kitchen and I'm tired of having these dull kitchen knives. I constantly <laughs> have to sharpen. So, you know, I, I sat down one day and I, I had my little pairing style knife, my steak knife that I did. And I did this in AEBL. I mean, some people are like, Oh, I don't want a carbon steel kitchen knife. But hearing what you said about the 8670, I was like, you probably know that that knife is going to keep an edge a lot longer mm -hmm. than um, just like your cheaper stainless steel, your VG10 would. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, look, if you if you want a really, really good kitchen knife, you should do something. I'm not saying that um, there aren't better stainless ones, but if you're looking for an affordable, really nice, tough kitchen knife, get yourself just a little bit higher carbon. So I've been playing around with that, which... Doing thin blades like that has done, has been a huge learning experience for me, especially with heat treating. Oh, man. So, do you have to do all the grinding after heat treat with a chef's knife? Uh, pretty much. I mean, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take just a small bevel at the bottom and grind it to where um, you need it to be where for, for heat treat. And then I'll bring that bevel all the way up slowly after uh, I heat treat it. But with something like uh, these predators, where if you look, it's pretty thick. If I try to grind this after I heat treat it, I'm going to be going through belt after belt. So I will do most of my grinding before I heat treat on those. And another reason you do that is um, if you're doing an acid stone wash, if, like when you're dipping into acid, if there is a part on that blade that got way too hot, it's going to have different coloration than um, the rest of the blade will. So if you grind primarily all your, your grinds before you heat treat, you're going to have that even nice hard steel all the way through and just touch up the edges. So that's, that's how I've been kind of experimenting with getting the, the perfect finish on those. But when you're, when you go to make the chef's knives, uh, you don't have that luxury because you have to go super thin, right? And, and when you go super thin and then heat treat, that's when you get the warpage. Oh yeah. And okay. I mean, you can use a carbide hammer, but like to straighten it on an anvil. But if, if you're super thin and you're going to try to grind all of those little divots out, sometimes you can't get them all out. And I don't want my, my knives to have that. So I, I do all my heat, tre uh, heat treating and then I grind them. And I've been, I guess this week I'm now doing hollow grinds and I got <laughs> to grind on a wheel, like a rubber wheel instead of uh, a metal platen. And that has been a huge game changer. So I'm probably going to be doing a lot more hollow grinds here soon. Uh, I laughed because you said, I guess I'm doing hollow grinds. And to me, that seems like a, you know, very conscious decision. Uh, Cause it's a, isn't it hard? Aren't hollow grinds kind of hard to do? Um, I mean, yeah, yes and no. But for me, the way that grinding against the rubber versus metal, like all I've ever ground against was metal. And it's the metal's not forgiving. If you bear in too hard on on one part of that blade, you can have a line that goes all the way up and you may never get it out with the rubber. It kind of forms to what you're working on. So, I mean, your lines as you're grinding it are, are more straight from what I've noticed. And I mean, this was the the first hollow grind that I did. Yeah, that's. Cool. And I did a a compound style, but I mean, the edge that I got on it was phenomenal. I I have never really owned a hollow grind knife before, but it it, it was a cool experience. So. Yeah, I'm a big fan of hollow uh, ground knives. That all started just from how they look. Uh, I, a lot a lot of my um, you know attraction to knives is how they look. Um, and that thin hollow grind, man, it always reminds me of a straight razor and it just means business. But then when I actually started cutting with them and, and discovering how nicely they slice and how deeply, uh, you know, how deeply they cut. Yeah. I love hollow grinds. Um, 
Yeah, I was under the impression they were really hard to do, but um, I, I like that visual of having the rubber. You know, the rubber warms up and gets soft, and then it's against the the hardness of that of the steel, it, and it it's conforming, and and you mm -hmm. can I could see how you could guide it more. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, and after grinding on the wheel too, there's there's something called a rotary platen, which is a flat platen that has a rubber wheel that actually rotates as you're grinding. And that's what John Gray does a lot of his grinding on. Um, and everybody keeps telling me, you know, you need to get one of these. You do a lot of flat grinds. It's going to change. It's going to change your game. So that's definitely next on my list. And I have never seen it done before. I'm not saying it hasn't, but a hollow grind karambit. I really want to try to do that. I want yeah. you to try that. That sounds awesome. Uh, yeah, because perfect for that style of knife. I mean, uh, with that point getting in there and then it's, it's yeah, it's, yeah, that sounds like a, that sounds like a, a great idea. I want to ask you um, about the, the business aspect of knife making. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that you got a degree in business and, um, but you have this uh, love of this thing, these, uh, you know, knives that are not, it's not like such a common thing that people uh, gravitate towards. So what has the business of knife making been like for you, um, having kind of studied it in an abstract sense and then having to put those skills to use in a real sense with knife making? So, I mean, it's really supply and demand. Um, I mean, I, I do a lot of my own research by just going through different makers pages seeing what's popular seeing what people like and really just finding you have to find the product and then the price that you want to have it at and figure out the the different steps you have to take to make that come to life and one thing that i mean i'd always heard from people is i wish these people had better customer service i mean i'm not saying most knife makers don't but i wanted to basically if you buy a knife from me have you have the understanding of I want you to beat this thing to hell. I want you to show it off, use what, like use it how it's supposed to be used. And if you send it back to me and just cover shipping, I will do a full like complete spot treatment on it for free for you. Just because, I mean, you're, you're out there using my knife, you're putting it to use of, of what it's supposed to be used for. So to me that that's more satisfying than anything. I, I just like to see my, my work being used and showed off. So, so who, who are your customers? I mean, I have had a wide array of customers. Uh, I, I can't really tell you who he is because he asked me not to, but the way this Picao came about is this guy, for, I guess for a living, arrests and, and takes people in. And sometimes he gets himself into situations where he has to defend himself. And he was like, I need the handle this specific length. I need the blade mm -hmm. this length to, to penetrate thicker clothing when it gets cold. Um, and I want you to put your twist on it. So. I, uh, that's that's how that came about. Wait, I hold have, it up, hold it up, if you will. Yeah, I have people like uh, there's this collector named Ronnie Smith. He's bought a bunch of knives for me. Who he doesn't even use them. They just he has a whole wall where he puts them on display uh, as art knives. I mean, yeah. and one of my favorites was the guy who throws knives for a living, and he turned one of my karambits into a throwing knife that he threw like 20 feet and stuck in a tree. So. Whoa. Cool. I've had a good variety of people. <laughs> That's cool. I I love the idea of of how that. What's the name of that uh, Pical knife? So this is called the Pical Rick. And if you have ever seen Rick and Morty and know about Pickle Rick. That's, I mean, the pea cow, the pickle, that's, uh, that's yeah, how yeah. that came about. I like to do some, some clever word choice there. Yeah. I, I like the idea of uh, some, I don't know what he is, but Marshall or law enforcement guy or bail bondsman walking around with, uh, with that pick call designed by himself for that purpose. Yep. You know, gotta, gotta hook it into the bad guy to, uh, to bring him in. Uh, that's kind of cool. And, and yet it's not a, uh, it's not a bench made. It's not black traction G10. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's also an art piece. It's like a devastatingly, uh, um, uh, dangerous one, but it, it has that, uh, all of those characteristics, uh, and flares. So at, as, as JKK grows, uh, how do you want the, how do you want the company to evolve and how do you want your work, the knives themselves to evolve? I mean, I really do not want to scale this into some huge, big production company just because for me, like 
what I, like I get to wake up every day and go and do something that I enjoy and, and get paid for it as well as forming really awesome uh, relationships with new people I get to meet. And I want to keep it to the point where I have my hands on every single knife. I mean, I, I do have the people that I have to outsource some stuff to just because I don't have the equipment for it. Mm -hmm. That may be, um, the next thing that I look into when, when I get the funds in shop, like more shop space to do is to, to build my own full shop, get my, my milling machine and kind of have everything in one spot to where it's, it's almost a one shop stop or one, uh, one spot shop, should I say? But yeah, I mean, I, I probably will get some help with some social media sometime soon and the whole website thing, just so I'm not constantly having to go back and forth with people, uh, through Facebook Messenger and, and stuff like that and collecting payments. So that's something I'll probably get some help with just to to help me do what I'm good at and and let other people kind of take a little bit off my plate. So yeah, that, I think that sounds smart. And you can you can uh, reign over your business and have other people doing some of the grunt work. Um, and and by grunt work, I know it's you know, but cutting out the blanks and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would be totally remiss as a husband and a father of two girls. If I didn't ask you, um, in terms of like, have you ever thought about making a sort of semi-production knife, something still made in the States with the people that you work with, but something that's optimized for, you mentioned women's pockets on women's clothing. Mm -hmm. If, if they exist at all are very small. And that's something my wife runs into. Um, you know, half the knives I've given her don't fit there. So she puts it in her waistband, that kind of thing. Do you have any designs uh, specifically for this issue? Well, what I would say for women with self-defense, and I mean, this is why I, yeah, yes, I have my, my folder in my, my little pocket bag that I carry, but the main knife that I have on me at all times is a fixed blade, just because if you do get into that time sensitive, um, you know, combat situation where someone's up running up on you, you don't have time to flick out a knife like that. Yeah. And it would be the first knife that I originally designed and came up with it. It would be this knife right here because the handle, the size of it's already great. Um, you know, the sheath that it comes with this Kydex with a, a clip that clips on, you could put it in your purse. Uh, it actually fits completely in, in any jeans or leggings that I have. You can just stick it right in your front pocket and mm -hmm just about i would say this much sticks out to where you can get your finger in there and just whip it right out um so enough to yeah. show people not to mess <laughs> yeah exactly and i mean it's not something that i mean you really have to look for it but if you have your t-shirt on you can just pull it right over and you you can't even see it so yeah and and it's got uh, the the camo carbon or whatever that fat carbon handle is it looks like what is that you know uh, if you're not familiar with a uh, ringed thing and you see the colorful you just might not even know what it is until it's too late yeah and so what you were saying about how like with the the peak owl rick the you know it's not black g10 it's not just a simple finish when people ask me to to do like you know do you ever just do plain steel black nothing fancy i'm like i mean i can but do i want to no <laughs> not really because yeah. I have probably made more connections just walking around. I mean, believe it or not, I have people that EDC this knife and I took it to the grocery store one time. And I mean, I got some horrified looks from people, but <laughs> I also get questions of, you know, what is that? Like it, it stands out. Like, do you do this yourself? And I give them a business card. And I mean, I, I've made some, some really good connections and sales just by, by carrying my work. I, it really speaks for itself if, if you're looking out for it. So, uh, I agree. Couldn't agree more. Uh, let people know how to find your work, how to keep up with your work and, uh, and get on your books. So until I have the whole website thing figured out my Instagram, which is JKK underscore customs, you can send me a DM on there. Um, I do, I would say most of my posting in all of my sales and auctions in my Facebook group, just because it's a little bit more private. I have it to where you have to answer some questions to join. Mm. I know there's no bots or, you know, unwanted posts like I've gotten sometimes in my groups that you can't control. Um, and just send me a messenger on, on that. And I really don't like to give out my personal number on the internet, but if you have my business cards, it would have my phone number, my email. 
Um, I mean, jkkcustomknives at gmail.com. You're always welcome to email me on there. But um, until we get, I mean, I may even get a business number just so I'm not giving my personal number out as well. So yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, but but to keep up with your daily uh, creations and such, go to Instagram and uh, you've got a, a pretty pretty active post there and on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jen Lynn, JKK Custom Knives, thank you so much for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really admire your work, and uh, and and I think you've got a, a really a bright career ahead of you. Thank you. I really appreciate it, and thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. There she goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jen Lint of JKK Custom Knives. Uh, yeah, I'm, I feel myself sliding back into a karambit mode, uh, the, the one she kept holding up. Uh, I think that might be the one I held in my hand. I know it fits my hand perfectly. Um, so I'm going to have to, well, I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, be sure to join us next week for another great conversation, Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. We're going to be giving away a lot of knives we're going to be giving away a knife every Thursday night for a while because uh, OG Blades just sent me a huge box to give away. So join us on Thursday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast